Um, so I'm, I'm at Western Carolina University. My name is Brian Bird. It might seem like a strange place to have a vector-borne disease specialist or public health entomologist, but um, um, we, we're actually an endemic area for a, a mosquito-borne disease, literally right in our backyard that we've spent a lot of time, uh, sort of the bulk of our focus. Um, my undergraduate training was in biology at UNC Asheville, and then my master's in uh, public health and PhDs from Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. And uh, I just wanted to say with the, the title here, you know, uh, it was sort of a title given to me and I, I don't wanna um, make the, uh, the, uh, uh, the case here that, um, you know, the, the sky is quite falling yet, but I do wanna make the case that we, we do need to, to be ready and establish um, some resilience for, for work ahead. And then furthermore, you know, it's sort of strange to be in a, uh, a conference on clean air, but then, so when I was asked this initially, I thought, uh, well, sure, um, at least from an etymologic perspective, there's, there's precedence there with, with malaria, uh, literally meaning bad air. And for those of you that aren't familiar with vector-borne diseases, um, we're really talking about these organisms that have for, you know, millennia and certainly the course of human history, um, caused any number of diseases, but these are, are caused by pathogens that are, that are vectored or, or transmitted by arthropods, including mosquitoes, which, you know, I'll sort of focus on as a case study, but, but certainly ticks in North Carolina and then fleas, lice, as we sort of move globally to uh, other things like sand flies, heat sea flies, black flies, rejuvid bugs, and, and many other things. So, so that's what, what I'm talking about here in, in the context of when I use the term vector, vector-borne disease. And in North Carolina specifically, we have, you know, at least from a mosquito-borne perspective, we have what I like to think of as two different groups of, of mosquito-borne pathogens. These that are zoonotic, where animals really are the sort of reservoir or amplifying hosts. Um, and that includes, you know, diseases like uh, lacrosse encephalitis uh, caused by lacrosse virus, West Nile, Eastern equine, and St. Louis encephalitis. And those last three are ones where birds play a, a predominant role in, um, in terms of transmission because of their reservoirs. So predicting these diseases across um, different spatial scales can be really tough because we're not just relying on human activity, we're also relying on uh, you know, other animals along the way in addition to mosquitoes. And then we have down here at the bottom these anthropogenic uh, pathogens where humans, at least from a urban human perspective, they're really uh, responsible for driving the epidemics along with the mosquitoes. So there's human to mosquito to human transmission. And of course, if you lived in North Carolina, or North America, or in the Americas in the last five years, you heard about Zika. And then um, we continue to have um, ongoing dengue introduction. Uh, prior to Zika, we had a chikungunya um, uh, uh, outbreak in the Americas. And then um, we even have malaria transmission. We have about 1,500 cases of malaria, you know, in North America or the United States every year um, from travel. So, you know, these diseases are complex to begin with. So trying to, to lump any of them into these umbrella terms gets really tough because there can be different vectors and different um, human behaviors and other animal behaviors along the way. So I wanted to kind of start off and I, I can't see the chat or anything. So you can kind of just self-assess here. But you know, think think on your own, what's the most commonly diagnosed and reported mosquito-borne disease here in, in North Carolina, um, you know, it, and, and, you know, maybe this is a, a, off the tip of your tongue, uh, but if not, you might be surprised that it's, it's actually malaria. Malaria is the most common disease that's uh, diagnosed in, in North Carolina, and that's all travel acquired. But just a reminder that, you know, as we pay attention to the diseases that we have in our backyard, we still have this, um, this threat of, you know, travel associated disease. And, um, so we haven't had any, you know, local transmission of malaria, but we still have the vectors that um, can transmit this mosquito. And so I'm assuming everyone's batting 100 there, so I'll, I'll give you another question, right? So what's the most common uh, reported mosquito-borne disease that occurs or is endemic in North Carolina, just to kind of gauge, gauge where you're coming from? And the answer there is actually lacrosse encephalitis. So that, that's my bailiwick. That's the one that's here in Western North Carolina. And it's the one I'm gonna to use to start off with as sort of, sort of a case example about you know, why vector-borne diseases are complex to begin with and predicting them are, is complex. And then um, kind of trying to think our way through in, in the context of climate change is, is even tougher. And so if you look up here in the upper left-hand corner, you see at least this time period, mosquito-borne diseases that uh, you know there were from 
acquired in North Carolina. And the white bars are lacrosse encephalitis. So that's uh, mainly a predominantly pediatric illness. Um, but if you look at the black bars, that's the second most common um, arboviral disease. This is excluding malaria. Um, this uh, is, is West Nile. So even though West Nile and occasionally an Eastern equine encephalitis case gets, hits the news, um, for most of the state, um, there's not a lot of attention applied, paying, paid to our, our most common mosquito-borne disease. Um, shown in the right is just an uh, image. It's an image that came from the internet from a mom who shared this online and uh, on Facebook and also with the news. This is a child who's suffering from lacrosse. He's intubated on a ventilator, um, has, uh, has got undergoing invasive neurological monitoring. So this isn't a, um, although commonly it is a mild disease, it can cause severe disease and lifelong uh, neurologic sequelae, but fortunately the case fatality is low. And so when we try to associate those white bars to what's actually going on with this, you know, kid, um, we also have to step back and think about, well, how did this happen? And the mosquito that's primarily responsible for this disease is one that's uh, called the eastern tree hole mosquito. And uh, sort of shown here in the bottom left, this is, this is actually prime mosquito habitat um, with this tree hole. You can't see it in there, but there's water containing larvae. And western North Carolina has, you know, got dense hardwoods. It, this is a common mosquito commonly found. And then thinking about what happens uh, around a residence in terms of maybe making some anthropogenic uh, habitat, such as artificial containers that can hold water, um, you can see that this gets complex right out of the gate, uh, thinking about inherent risk, things we may do to modify the environment. And then we add on to that just the innate biology of these organisms and recognize that the mosquitoes um, all have aquatic life stages, right? So uh, in the case of this eastern tree hole mosquito, the eggs are laid in, the, in, the, in these tree holes. They have to get flooded with water, sort of shown here um, with the, in blue. Um, these eggs can overwinter and the mosquitoes can, um, will hatch in the spring, go through four different instars as larvae, turn into pupae, and then from the pupae is when the uh, adult emerges. But I point out the, the aquatic habitat because water is a key part of the, the mosquito's uh, life cycle here. So it's very vulnerable to um, rainfall, very vulnerable to drought. And so, you know, we, we take all this into consideration when we think about, about the disease risk. So this is clearly an environmental health problem, uh, clearly an environmental link. And if you've, if you've lived in areas after a hurricane, uh, you might have experienced what was experienced here in uh, Northeast Florida um, uh, with Hurricane Matthew, that you can have sort of background mosquito um, abundance. And then, you know, a couple of weeks, you know, to 15 days after a hurricane, you can get this, um, this massive hatch, right? So this massive hatch of mosquitoes. And so, you know, you might even have days of a thousand mosquitoes collected in a light trap in some parts of, of, you know, even North Carolina, but certainly parts of Florida, but then you get these orders of magnitude increases of mosquitoes. And those are often associated with increased complaints from home owners shown here in box A, where these are the number of service requests compared to, you know, the shoulder months of September and November here, you know, they increase by an order of magnitude. And you can see there's a delay in that request for needing help, right, or associated with the abundance of mosquitoes um, that occurs after those hurricane events. So if you think about what's going on during that time, there may be still, you know, residual work being done, restoring electricity, clearing, um, you know, roads, and sort of, you know, the, the sort of response to post-hurricane hurricane events. So this, these mosquitoes can be a direct nuisance and harbor, and, and hinder rather, um, uh, emergency response or recovery. And then I do want to say that, you know, that, that looks pretty impressive to have that, that big hatch right there. And you might be tricked into thinking that that's associated with disease risk, but it may not be immediately the case because all those mosquitoes um, generally have to have two blood meals in order to literally transmit that pathogen. They have to have a blood meal where they get infected. And then that second blood meal is when they, they transmit that pathogen. So if we look at this sort of from a, a model perspective, if you were, or, or cartoon perspective on with X being your, your time um, and Y being, you know, adult survivorship. If you have a hatch, this is, this is the hatch of all those mosquitoes post a hurricane after lots of area were uh, inundated with water, you might get, you know, tens of thousands of mosquitoes in a light trap. 
but they probably, they haven't had a blood meal yet. So they're, they're what we call Nola Paris. They haven't laid eggs, they haven't had a blood meal. And so their probability of being infected is very, very, very low. But as you go in time in those mosquito populations, as they're decreasing, we estimate between eight and 10% of a population uh, is lost every day. So you got this kind of decay curve. What you see is that at some point they're gonna take a blood mill and that may be when some proportion of them become infected. And then, you know, there goes through an incubation period, much like we might think of in humans, the incubation period in the mosquitoes. And then they become a, a problem in terms of disease or, or pathogen transmission. So, so that always, that disease doesn't always match up with abundance is sort of one of my key sort of take homes here for you. And then we kind of in the medical entomology, public health entomology world, we use this idea of a vectoral capacity to kind of think through risk. It's almost analogous to a reproductive number uh, taking into consideration to some degree mosquitoes. And, I, I, and I'm not here, here to kind of, you know, make the case for the math more so than make the case for the constitutive parts here that, you know, uh, your risk is ultimately based on being bitten by a mosquito, right? So the number of bites matters. Um, the probability of daily survival matters the extrinsic incubation period or that time from the mosquito becoming uh, exposed to the virus to infectious uh, matters. And then whether what mosquito it is or what vector it is actually matters too. Not all mosquitoes will feed on humans. Not all mosquitoes can be, can capably transmit a particular pathogen. And I point this out because most of these are actually very dependent on temperature. So in some instances, small, very small changes in temperature will decrease the extrinsic incubation period. So the warmer it is, theoretically, your extrinsic incubation, extrinsic incubation period will decrease. And because at the same time, you're dealing with the effects of daily survivability, um, you can end up with more, uh, higher proportion of infected mosquitoes. So, and these have been really well established with lab studies, but in the real world, you know, this, is, this gets a little tough to uh, tease out especially recognizing the mosquitoes don't live in a vacuum, right? So mosquitoes are, are these larval in their larval habitat are, are interacting with many different types of organisms. This is a study, uh, a student at uh, VCU named Andy Davis recently published this, and uh, he, he does some work with our group too, but basically uh, showing how temperature warming accelerates in the presence of a predator um, accelerates both larval mosquito development, so that's kind of expected, and the, but also it also increases the consumption rate of those prey by dragonflies, right? So when we, again, we start to predict these impacts of temperature on mosquito-borne disease, you know, the, the web gets more and more complex as we think about uh, these interactions. So, so what do we know about what contributes to mosquito-borne disease risk? We know that abundance matters, we know that age matters, biting behavior matters, and host availability and contact matters too. So this is sort of one of my take home studies here uh, that I'd like to share. And it's one called Texas Lifestyles Limits uh, Transmission of Dengue Virus. And this has nothing to do with brisket beef or um, 10 gallon hats. It's a study, it was done on the border of Laredo, Texas and the waiver Laredo. And so if you think about the impacts of climate change, you might say at least from a temperature or probably drought or uh, rain events, these are gonna be experienced very similarly because this is very fairly focal in, in space. And so this is a cross-sectional study done uh, to look at uh, dengue prevalence and um, the presence of mosquitoes. And what was surprising is that actually through the survey, they found more mosquitoes on the US side versus the Texas side using this index called a Bruteau index, which was basically the number of infested containers, meaning there were larvae in these containers per 100 households. So, not quite three times higher in the U.S. So you might expect that the antibody prevalence might be higher on the in the U.S. side, but it was actually quite the opposite, right? So we saw that at least from an IgM perspective, which is indicative of, of recent exposure, you might think of it in terms of incidence. In the Wave Laredo or Texas, it was 16% compared to an order of magnitude difference on the, on, on the U.S. side. And then IgG may be a little more difficult to interpret because it's uh, evidence of any prior exposure really. And so, but you still saw, you know, uh, half that uh, IgG prevalence in the US side versus, versus Texas side. Now, this was a cross-sectional study, so it's, it's a little tough to get at why, but um, what they did, found is air, did find is that air conditioning and the presence of evaporated coolers or swamp coolers 
uh, we're fairly um, uh, 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 much higher in the, on, on the U.S. side. And even so, when you look at the cost of electricity, um, you might you might not be surprised, but um, the cost of electricity was actually cheaper in Mexico than than Texas. But when you looked at it from a you know percent of uh, per capita GDP, um, to run an air conditioner would would cost about four and a half percent of GDP at the time in Texas, where it's almost a quarter of that per capita GDP in 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 Mexico. So so. What I'm trying to say is that, that this is complicated. We know that the, the environment and even, you know, sort of social economic status um, sort of proxies can be protective factors in some instance. We know there's been an upward trend in the number of heavy precipitation days in North Carolina, um, partially due to hurricanes. We know that temperatures have increased in North Carolina since record keeping began. We've, we've documented increased invasive mosquito species in North Carolina over the past three decades. Um, you know, and, and, and then we also know that mosquitoes that were previously known from the south, deep south, um, have been found in North Carolina. Um, so we've seen mosquitoes, you know, traditionally found in Texas, Georgia, Florida, with some range expansion into the U.S. or into North Carolina. And we, you know, I haven't even talked about ticks here, recognizing that at least from a North Carolina perspective, the tick burden of disease is, is, is much higher than, than mosquito burden. And that this risk varies across the state. So I mentioned lacrosse encephalitis. This is that the disease that's shown here in the map on top, where it's predominantly a Western North Carolina phenomenon, uh, where if you look at Lyme disease, the tick-borne disease on the bottom, um, you know, it's, it may look a little patchy, but this changes over time, where just in the last decade, we've seen a focus occur in the upper Northwestern part of the state. So, all this is, is tough to, to, to sort of pull together and, and make predictions. And I'd say that, um, you know, that's one of the reasons that um, it, it makes sense to work as interdisciplinary teams, especially fostering partnerships with people like even community ecologists trying to kind of game out and predict what things like uh, temperature and drought and um, increased uh, precipitation is going to actually do to us. And so, you know, we recently wrote just sort of an opinion piece rather uh, invited commentary for the North Carolina Medical Journal and kind of came up with these ideas of strategies that might um, help promote resilience. So really to think about, you know, first off that your risk is going to be different across the state, maybe a regional approach makes sense. And we need to look at, you know, sort of understand vulnerability at that level and the ability to, you know, sort of respond. Um, we expect climate change to impact vector-borne diseases in North Carolina. We really can't predict exactly how it's going to happen. So we need to be prepared to address these and be sort of nimble and able to move to anticipate and prepare for it the, at, a, at a local level. Also, you know, sort of the classic public health challenge of whether or not we need to secure sufficient funding instead of relying on episodic grants and, um, you know, enhance surveillance, not just for the diseases themselves, but to understand perhaps how to react at the local level, have a, a better handle on uh, entomologic surveillance also. So with that, I'll just say that, um, you know, I'm interested in hearing from the group about, you know, your ideas and thoughts about uh, uh, resilience and uh, uh, appropriate responses from a vector-borne disease perspective. This QR code, if you want it, is a, um, it takes you to that uh, North Carolina commentary where we go a little more in depth and, pro depth and provide a little more um, evidence for you. So <laughs> the last, next five or 10 minutes or so for the group, I'd, I'd like to open it up and uh, thank you all for, for having me today. I wanna thank you, Brian. Um, we're, uh, I think we're small, uh, not small enough audience, we're a good sized audience that uh, if people have a question, uh, I think they can unmute themselves uh, and interact uh, directly with, uh, with Brian. And I can see the chat at this point too. So if you wanna put it in the chat, I'm glad to. Yes, either way, okay, I'm glad that's available to you. So, um, uh, Dr. Keener has a question. Yeah, I, I do. Thanks. Thanks. That was really, really interesting, um, Brian. Stephen Keener. Um, I'm in Belmont. Um, I'm just interesting if you've heard much or seen much about um, the uh, you know change in in prevalence of um, 
of bees and wasps and stinging vectors uh, because of changes in the climate? Yeah, I, I'm not, I can't answer that right now. I can certainly find the answer for you. Um, you know, I think a lot of times we lump those things together, recognizing that bees are very complex taxa to begin with. So um, um, I'd, I'd be hesitant, I'm, I'm hesitant to answer that with any uh, evidence at this point. So, but I'm glad to, uh, to get you an answer to that and, res and respond uh, if you wanna, wanna email me. Thanks. Um, by the way, Andrew, the chat function is disabled, at least for me, so. Um, perhaps it's a host thing because Brian and I can see it. Now it's working. Yep. Now okay, it's man. <laughs> so Brian, I had a question about um, the larger ecosystem upon which these um, mosquitoes in part depend. And if there is some parallel shift that's associated with more or less rainfall or more or less warmer temperatures that um, either encourages or inhibits the mosquito population. Yeah, so, you know, pop it, what I, what I, one of the points I wanna get across is that although we like to focus on mosquito abundance because that's often easier to measure, it's not necessarily predictive of disease. And in fact, we see disease often when mosquito abundance is low. And so things that may generate a lot of mosquitoes, such as rainfall events or hurricanes, at first um, are, are disconnect sometimes with disease. And sometimes we see some of our biggest outbreaks, like West Nile, for example, and St. Louis encephalitis, this is very well documented, actually during drought conditions, because you get sort of these pockets of water where you get the, you know, ver birds coming in, um, you get the mosquitoes coming in, and even you get, get, get humans coming in. And so there's this focus where kind of, you know, going back to the sort of nidus sort of ide ideology that um, you know, of enhanced uh, transmission. So, so just because we have more mosquitoes doesn't necessarily mean we're more mosquito-borne disease risk. Um, but mosquitoes are very susceptible to rainfall and drought. So when do you expect an uptick in uh, dengue in North Carolina? So I think that that's where that paper I showed you sort of demonstrates maybe how we're protected with, because of the built environment, right? So you think of 80% plus of households in, in North Carolina with air conditioning or at least you know screen windows. And so that's probably what protects us from disease um, for, from a, quite a bit of these diseases. That's why we probably didn't have a lot of local transmission of Zika or, or, or dengue or chikungunya because we don't have a lot of exposures. There's not that kind of contact. In addition, we don't have that, uh, any evidence of that particular vector, the yellow fever mosquito Aedes aegypti. And not to dominate here. Um, in addition, I, I'm, I'm worried about these uh, ticks more than anything else. Um, <laughs> so uh, in addition to the uptick uh, in these uh, vectors, is there uh, uh, also an increased distribution of kinds of tick-borne diseases? Yeah, so um, yes, I mean, we've seen in Western North Carolina, just sort of taking a local lens, we've seen an increase in Lyme disease. Um, you know, we have now counties that are considered endemic, um, both with evidence of the tick and non-travel exposure that we weren't seeing for any number of reasons, not just entomologic, um, even a decade ago or two ago. Um, there's uh, newly invasive ticks that are being recognized um, uh, along the way also. So we, we have both, you know, uh, evidence of increased recognition, whether that's clinic, you know, alone, just based on, you know, for, from a clinical perspective, I think would be hard to make. Um, and we also see evidence of, uh, you know, new vectors, both mosquitoes and, um, and ticks. Uh, do you see the question from Robert Parr in the chat? Right, so yeah, there's a question that says, 30 years ago, tick bites were a summertime occurrence risk now. On the coast, it's a year long threat. Is the rise in average temperature with climate change related to increased tick exposure risk in the mountains? Um, and again, this is the tough part about this sort of kind of working backwards, right? And 
again, why we need to sort of rely on entomologic surveillance. You know, I've been at Western Carolina for, you know, 13 years now, and there's not a lot of, you know, tick-borne surveillance going on in the mountains, right? So, so, so just try to say it was going on 15, 20 years ago is impossible at this point from a tick perspective. So, um, so I, I can't, and, and we, similarly, we don't have really good tick exposure risk data. So, so I, again, that's where we need to, from a resilience perspective, really focus on, um, on, 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 you know, surveillance and, um, and get a handle on that and get that baseline data now. So interesting. Um, and it's so, you know, we forget, you know, look, look at about the uh, COVID, you know, we forget about infectious diseases as uh, such a potential threat uh, to human health. You know, we drifted to the cardiovascular and cancer uh, bucket, um, but the persistent threat of these infectious diseases that are increasingly exacerbated by the conditions that you've shared, um, I think needs our attention. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'd absolutely agree. I think, you know, we, we talk about these epidemiologic transitions and, you know, even outside of things like microbial adaptation and antibiotic resistance from an from a infectious disease perspective. I, I think uh, it would be very unwise to ignore vector-borne diseases. Well, Dr. Bird, um, I appreciate your presentation. Uh, I do an infectious disease class and I have never heard of lacrosse. Um, so I learned a lot, uh, right. which is what I typically do uh, with these kinds of uh, presentations. Um, I'm so glad you were able to join us. I'm so pleased you were able to uh, accept the uh, invitation to participate. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing your work in um, these uh, outlets. Yeah, my pleasure. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to email me and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>